Good to see everybody out with us this morning. Thank you so much for being here. And I want to encourage and invite everybody to follow along with the things that we'll have to discuss in the sermon this morning. I've entitled this morning's sermon, uh, Giving Thought to Generosity. And I think we all understand that we have reached the period of the year, really from Thanksgiving Day to the end of the year, when people tend to be thinking a little bit more about generosity, a little bit more about Thanksgiving during this period of time. Whenever people are thinking about generosity, thinking about gratitude, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. As Christians, the hope is certainly that our thoughts about those things are not limited to this time of the year, but we certainly should be thinking about them during this time of the year. And if there are some who only do it at this time, it is always good to think this way. Generosity is defined as being liberal in giving or sharing, being unselfish. Now, I want to state something here at the beginning of the sermon. I think that we're all going to understand that this is absolutely the case. And I want to state this because we're actually going to be focusing in this morning upon a human example of generosity. But God is the pinnacle of generosity, um, spiritually and physically. Just a handful of passages to think about here. Over in James chapter 1 and verse 5, James says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Our Lord in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 44 and 45, He said this, But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son, <coughs> excuse me, to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. The Apostle Paul kind of picks up on a similar thought over in Acts chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. And he says, in past generations, he, that he is God, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So whether we're dealing with it from a spiritual perspective, or we're dealing with it from a material, physical perspective, I think that we understand and need to recognize God is the absolute pinnacle of generosity. But as I said, we're going to be focusing this morning upon an extraordinary example of generosity from one human to another. And I don't know if you've really thought about it. In that way, I know that I haven't really until I was really thinking about it this past week. But I want us to consider Genesis chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. And the verses are up here on the screen. We'll read them in just a moment. But just kind of setting the stage for this and the context, both Abram and Lot were prospering. They were doing very well. Their herds were growing to the extent that if they remained together, it was going to pro uh, produce a problem. There just wasn't enough space. And in fact, it was beginning to produce a problem. Lot's herdsmen and Abram's herdsmen were beginning to butt heads. And before this could become a real issue between Abram and Lot, Abram called Lot to him and they had this, or rather I should say, Abram made this incredible offer. So I want you to read this with me. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? 
separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. We know this choice that Abram gave Lot. We've been reading about it. Those of us particularly whose parents are Christians, we've heard this all of our lives. What I really want us to focus in upon is the extraordinary generosity displayed by Abram here to Lot. Now it is worth pointing out, and I think some might confuse this from time to time, they are in what would be the promised land. So wherever Lot chooses to go does not mean that Abram's going to be stuck out in the desert with no water and no food. There's a lot of good land here. But what Abram is doing is giving Lot the first choice. And this is what jumps out to me, first of all, as we consider real generosity. It's genuinely selfless. So I want us to think about the relationship that existed between Abram and Lot from a number of different perspectives. I want to start with this. Abram was the one on a divine mission here. I mean, if we go back to Genesis chapter 12, we find God introducing himself to Abram, commissioning Abram, sending Abram on his way. Abram's on the divine mission. Lot's just tagging along for the ride. He just decided to go with Abram. He's not the one God appeared to. That's the first thing that I want us to consider. I also want us to consider this. If we were to read the first three verses of Genesis chapter 12, we would see Abram is God's chosen one. It is not Lot. It is impossible for me to imagine that Abram did not tell his family why he was leaving. And Elizabeth, and, or rather I should say Sarah, and, um, and uh, Lot just, just happened to go and had no idea why all of this was happening. I find it impossible to believe that. I think there's no question Abram told his family exactly why he was on his way, why they were leaving. It's because God appeared to him and commissioned him and told him to do this. He didn't appear to Lot. He didn't choose Lot. Lot's not the one who received all these promises. Abram was. I think it's worth bearing that in mind. Abram was also older here. He had the priority. Lot was his nephew. Abram was his uncle. And when we consider that Lot is leaving and going with his uncle, there is no doubt that in many times and in many ways, Abram, as the patriarch of this particular group, is going to behave as a father towards Lot. Abram had priority here. Lot certainly did not. As we go on... And if we were to read in Genesis 14, we would see that Abram protected Lot. He actually gathered a small force to go pursue some who had kidnapped him, had captured Lot. Abram's the one who went and rescued him. We have no indication anywhere that Lot ever did anything like that for Abram. And we also have no indication at all that Abram ever received, that he sought, that he prospered from Lot's presence. And Lot ever did anything for him, both before this instance and after. You put all of those things together and you consider them. We're looking at a situation where it would certainly seem as though Abram was well within his rights. To just say it a lot, now look at the situation we're in here. Our herdsmen are starting to butt heads. You know why we're making this journey. You know I'm the one that God chose. You're just tagging along with me here. I'm older than you. I'm your uncle. You're my nephew. I've taken responsibility for you. Here's how things are going to go. I'm going to find out a little plot of ground for you. That's where you're going. 
And if I tell you you can spread out from there, you can spread out. If not, you go where I tell you to go. It would seem like Abram was within his rights to do that. What he did was say, simply look out over the land. Whatever part of this you want, you can have. You get first choice. I'm giving you priority. And I'll make my decision based upon where you go. That teaches us something, I think, about generosity. I think it teaches us this. Just by its very nature, true generosity is selfless. It's others focused. I want you to turn your Bibles with me, if you will, over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to read the first four verses. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 4. Paul says this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. There's some pretty incredible statements there, and I think they really show us what true generosity is. The passage says they were begging Paul. They were begging him for the favor you ever think of, of, of being able to extend generosity as a favor being done you? You ever think of it that way? That's what Paul's saying about those churches. They, they were begging for the favor of being able to help other people. And they were not doing this from a place of wealth, from a place of an abundance. Paul called it not just poverty, but extreme poverty. And they were giving out of that. That's extraordinary. That is extraordinary selflessness. And it's at the heart of true generosity. But I'll tell you what. Generosity reaches its purest, truest form. When the first other considered is God. The very next verse. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5 is this. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. I want you to understand exactly what I'm saying here. I am not saying that there is deficiency in anyone's generosity if they're not doing it because they're thinking about God. That's not the point that I'm making here at all. People can be extraordinarily generous without giving a single thought to God. And it's good when they are generous. And it's good for those who are receiving the generosity because they are being helped. That's not the point that I'm making here. The point that I am making is this generosity at its purest form comes from a place where one is being generous out of recognition that God is generous. Where one is being generous because one is grateful for the generosity God has bestowed upon them. And they see themselves and they want to be those who become channels for the blessings, for the gifts, for the generosity that God gives towards men. And it's all with the desire to see him honored, to see him glorified. You can't get more pure than that, more selfless than that. And this leads into the next thought that I want us to consider. True generosity, the real thing, is absolutely disinterested in personal praise. 
in reciprocation. I want you to think again about what Abram did here. No indication that he broadcasted his generosity, is there? No indication that he demanded Lot acknowledge it. In fact, after Abram gave this option to Lot, this is all we read. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley. And Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. We don't have any indication here that Lot even said thank you for this choice. He may very well have, but it's not listed. It's not stated. Abraham gave him the option. Lot saw the best part of the land when it came to the specific need, watering and feeding the herds. And Lot just left and went there. And Abram moved in the opposite direction. But let me ask you this. We look at that and we see how extraordinary it is, how pure it is. But what if we were to learn that after making that choice, Abram went and perhaps went to the, went to the limit of the land that Lot had chosen and he set up a monument there. And that monument said, here is the land of Lot given him graciously from his uncle Abram, who gave him the opportunity to choose that land out of the purity and kindness of his own heart. Imagine if something like that were to be discovered. Imagine how it would change what we think about Abraham and what we see there. And what would have appeared to have been such a generous thing, suddenly, ooh, Abram, were, were you seeking to be praised here? Were you looking for honor to be held up, to be celebrated by? Is that what this was about? Because if it is, that's not generosity. At least not in its purest form. And another thing about it. With pure, true generosity, there is no thought that I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Jesus had a, a really interesting exchange. Turn your Bibles with me to Luke 14. Luke chapter 14. And we're going to pick up in verse 12. Now, if you start at the, the beginning of this chapter, you find that the whole thing is taking place, at least up to this point, within a dinner feast. Jesus has been invited. He has gone. He's saying a number of different things. But in verses 12 through 14, he's going to make a really interesting statement. And you might wonder, well, where did this come from? Why would this have even entered into the mind of Jesus? And I suspect... That as he was there and as he was listening to those who had been invited, perhaps he's hearing that schedules are being discussed. Okay, you've had us over. When can we have you over for a big feast? We want to we turn this around and give you back what you've given us. And maybe just a, a long line of feasts are being set up here. And perhaps... The one who invited Jesus and all of these other guests to this feast didn't do it from a place of generosity. Did it from a place of wanting to be held up and wanting people to do the same for him. Otherwise, I'm not sure why Jesus would say this. Let's read what he says. Verse 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. I think what Jesus is doing here is teaching a lesson about generosity. And he's showing that at least in the heart of this individual, he's thinking to himself, yes, I'm going to invite folks over. It's a very nice thing that I'm doing, and I'm glad that I have the ability to do this. But 
Think how many people are going to invite me over after this. Think how many people are going to feel the need to scratch my back because I just scratched theirs. Jesus is saying, if that's the motive, if that's at the heart of what's happening here, do not imagine anything good spiritually is being done by you inviting these folks over. The motive is wrong. The goal is wrong. So don't do that. Jesus had a tendency, we know, to go right to the heart of the specific problem, the specific hurdle in an individual's life, keeping them from coming to him all the way. We think of the rich young ruler. Jesus did not tell everyone to sell everything they have and give it to the poor, but he told him. Jesus did not tell everybody, do not invite. When you have a banquet or a feast, don't invite your friends. Don't invite your family. Don't invite your rich neighbors. Don't do that. But he told him, why? Knowing Jesus as we do, it is likely this mindset, this heart was a problem for him. And Jesus is trying to show him how to fix it. And if there is no, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. In true generosity, neither is there an appetite for fanfare. Monument erecting. I want you to turn your Bibles with me back to the Sermon on the Mount. Let's go to the first four verses of Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This is what Jesus says. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. There was a... Um, actually, it looked like a painting that somebody had done. It was at least a drawing that was filled in. And I think it was on Facebook that I saw it. And it was from somebody who would consider themselves a Christian and a problem that they see among many Christians today. And I'll be frank with you, it's a problem that I see as well. Social media has presented its challenges and really shined a spotlight on who some people really are. But this particular picture showed a family of four, father, mother, and two little children, wearing very threadbare, very dingy sort of clothing, and they had kind of sad expressions on their face. And it showed another individual. He had in his hand a bag of groceries, and he was handing that bag of groceries over to them with his phone up and a big smile on his face to take a selfie as he did it. I want you to think about that. Now, we talked about this uh, some time ago. Beloved, there may be good reasons, wholesome, pure reasons for someone to post on social media pictures of them giving something to somebody, of them helping somebody, of them praying or reading their Bible out in public. There may be good, wholesome, pure reasons to do that. But based upon what Jesus is saying here, there are some reasons that are not wholesome, that are not good, and that are not pure. Notoriety. The desire to be seen doing these things, to be praised doing these things, to be placed up on a pedestal. And Jesus said, those folks who want that, they have their reward. And what was it? Being noticed. That was the reward. But it certainly wasn't the Father approving. It certainly wasn't the, the Father applauding what's seen, what's happening. You see, the truth of the matter is, guys, there is a reward 
There is a reward for generosity, for pure, true generosity. The question is, is it enough for us? Because this is what it is. Another person was helped. Simple as that. Another person was helped. And no one else may ever know what was done for that individual. Jesus said, do it in secret. That's what he said there. In Matthew 6 and verse 4, it may be that no one else will ever know what generous deed was done for this person. It may be that that person hardly even acknowledges what was done, doesn't even care about it. It may be that that person may never be generous back and may never tell another soul what was done for them. My question is, if we knew that going in, would we still be generous? If we knew that would be the response before we even did it, would we do it? Because the reward is only another person was helped. And when that is the thinking of the child of God, God is glorified. God is glorified. That's the reward. The question is, is it a big enough reward for us to be generous? And my prayer is it certainly is. There's one more thought I want us to consider as we think about generosity this morning. I want us to think about the beauty of generosity's ideal outcome. Now, as I just said, it could very well be that uh, folks who see it, folks who are recipients of the generosity won't care won't say a thing about it, won't even acknowledge it. But I think you know as well as I do the pure selflessness of true generosity. It is striking. It really is. We have all seen people, Christian and non-Christian alike, engage in just such beautiful generosity, you can't help but be moved by it. And no doubt we've been recipients of that from Christian and non-Christian alike. It's just striking when you see the real thing. And though it may not be this way for all, and certainly it isn't for all, for those who are moved by witnessing it or even being a recipient of it, there is a motivating element to this. And I think it's a motivating element that comes in two different ways, gratitude and imitation. In 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10 and 11, the Apostle Paul says this, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. So think about that picture. Think about the picture that Paul is painting for us here. Individuals who are generous, being blessed by God to increase so that their generosity can increase. And the recipients of the ones receiving that generosity and hearing about that generosity are themselves being motivated to gratitude, motivated to thanksgiving. And that teaches us this, generosity and thanksgiving move a person closer to God, simply by virtue of what generosity and thanksgiving are, than if those things were absent. Now, maybe somebody says, well, hold on, there's a lot of people out there who receive generosity, who observe generosity, they don't become Christians. They're not willing to think about things uh, spiritually and have these sorts of discussions. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. But it is equally true that the generous heart and the grateful heart simply because of what generosity and gratitude are, 
has moved a step closer to God than if those things were absent. And it could very well be that taking those first steps will ultimately lead to the opening of doors that had previously been closed. When we think about the importance of generosity and the need to practice it, let us never fail to consider the evangelistic aspect of it and the positive example that it can have. Guys, when somebody witnesses a person who has been completely transformed by Jesus Christ out there shining his light as brightly as it can be shown, there is power in that. There is power there. And it's difficult not to notice. And for a good heart, it's impossible not to be moved. Let's think about these things. So this morning we focused in upon giving thought to generosity. Yes, we're thinking about it, especially at this time of the year. Man generally is thinking about it, especially at this time of the year. But let's make sure, beloved, it's on our minds every single day. It is powerful. It is Christ-like. And it can accomplish so much good in the life of the individual who needs it. And it may even lead them to Christ. And what could be more wonderful than that? So, let's give thought to generosity. Let's consider ourselves. And uh, let's be generous. Because our God is and we're grateful. We may have some this morning who are not yet Christians. Uh, who are not in that saved relationship with Jesus Christ. You can get in it. You can do it this morning. Believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that He did what He claimed that He did. Live a sinless, perfect life. Die in our place so that we can stand just and righteous before God. What a wonderful blessing. What a generous gift. You can take advantage of it this morning. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Jesus as Lord, and be immersed in water, baptized, to have your sins washed clean from your soul. All things are ready. The question is, are you? And if the answer is yes, please come forward now, as together we stand and sing. Why do you wait, dear brother?